Life tastes like cardboard. A game about boredom and self-pity. It's about myself, mostly. You walk around and press the interact button. Sorry for making this. Emotions are complicated. They are responsible for how we deal with various scenarios in our lives. And while we may have some wiggle room, sooner or later our emotions get the best of us. We can't exactly control how we feel at any given point. Rather, it's our emotions that control us, be it happiness, fear, or frustration. Death waits. This is just a reality of being human, but what happens when things just don't work? When you're just constantly not feeling your best self, and can't seem to change that no matter what you do? Depression is what happens. I don't think it's unfair to say that we've all experienced a period of sadness, and you may come out the other end feeling better, but that isn't always the case. Depression is perhaps the most common mental illness many people will experience, and understandably, it's sometimes hard to open up about your feelings. Emotions are hard to talk about because there is this vulnerability in being open about yourself. And that is no different in terms of the subject of this video essay. Life Tastes Like Cardboard is a game about one person's experience with depression, and like emotions, it's a game that's hard to talk about. On the one hand, it's a game that's focused on its overarching themes of depression and the things that come with depression, but it's also vast, empty, unfocused, and about nothing in particular. It's a game about everything and nothing, about highs and lows, it's about the complexities of emotion while undergoing depression. Through the sprouts of painful sadness, there's a sense of longing and distance. A feeling of wonder at the intricacies of life. The small things that make life just a little better. So what is this game about? Honestly, I can't give you the best sell for it because if you distilled the game down, it can be summed up as a walking sim that explores the subject of depression, sometimes? The general structure of the game can be broken down like this. You spend a segment of time in an area, walking around and interacting with that area, whether it's context for the protagonist, John, or dialogue from Oliver, the other important character in the story. Once the segment is over, you then have a small break period where you talk to a therapist about random topics, and if you find items through your exploration that seem familiar to John, you can bring them up in therapy to give more context to their significance. You may be asking yourself, what's the catch? And the catch is how abstract things are. As I said, it's a game about everything and nothing. Parts of the game have depression and mental health at the forefront, whereas others are nonsensical, like how deceiving selling orange juice in a can is. To the uninformed, the narrative may come off as disjointed, so it raises an interesting question. How do you market a game like this? Or rather, how do you market depression? Depression is a topic that doesn't exactly work well with a fast-paced, bombastic trailer like the ones you may see for Sabira films. I think this question of how one markets depression hasn't exactly been addressed because depression, or even for that matter, mental health, is never at the forefront of most of the games we play. Sure, the topic has been explored, but it's always as a secondary topic, or even just as a way to contextualize or flavor a setting, so to speak. Take the original quadrilogy of Silent Hill games, for example. 
there's always been a presence of mental health in these games, with the second entry arguably being the strongest case for that. However, the games aren't marketed to factor this. Rather, they are horror experience first. They present themselves as odd collages of scenes with Akira Yamaoka's music playing over to entice a viewer's intrigue. Another example will be from Software's Dark Souls series, which has been lauded for its extremely engaging and overbearingly depressive lore. However, taking a look at the trailers for the games tells a different story. The advertising is there to create interest and curiosity primarily. The trailer for the first game, for instance, uses its few bits of gameplay to showcase the bosses, thus showcasing what the initial drive of the game was, which was that it was a challenging game. I would say the trailer tries to instill dread, this realization of your insignificance in the face of these often large foes. The later games, Dark Souls 2 and 3, opt to instead use CG animation of various scenes to evoke mystery and mystique, with the third being the saddest of the three games. But are they depressing? Well, aside from the third game perhaps, which is a different topic, I wouldn't say so. The depressive lore is something that a player will have to find for themselves via their own means, such as reading lore in game or watching a video about it. There is of course a sense of sadness in the trailers, but it's more of a flavouring for the trailer rather than a hard-coded part of the brand. Even in terms of the game, I imagine you could theoretically play through the games somewhat unaware of how miserable the world of Dark Souls is. The final example I want to bring up is Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. The game is by no means an exploration of mental health, but rather it's a focus of the exploration of a post-apocalyptic world. But having said that, there is this strong feeling of Soviet depression that paints the whole world in misery. Being that the game is set within the area of Chernobyl, following the nuclear crisis. Everything is bleak, decrepit, damaged, and all of it ties to the sense of the kind of depression one would associate with Eastern European media. But the game doesn't make note of that element in its marketing. In the example I show, there's various segments of gameplay that purely focus on the action and combat of the game. And while it's true that Stalker does feature some intense combat scenarios, that's not all the game has to offer. The takeaway from these three examples shows that none of them really explore their depressive side in their marketing at all, and it is understandable why. Silent Hill is a psychological horror franchise that explores the human mind, so it's fair to assume mental health would be part of that experience. Dark Souls' focus primarily is on providing the player a challenge to overcome, and thus make them feel accomplished. And while there is a strong depressive lore that adds to the world of the respective games, a player is just as likely to ignore that backstory, and thus never interact with that part of the games entirely. As for Stalker, well, I'd say the focus of their marketing was on its impressive, but highly jank technology. The point in all of this is that while these games may have a presence of depression in them, they don't give a good indicator of how to center mental health in a game's marketing. There is a reason I'm drawing attention to the marketing in particular, because I think the way life tastes like cardboard presents itself is a unique case. In terms of marketing itself, it works, but to the detriment of its creator. I started this video with a quote from the game's own Steam page. Life tastes like cardboard, a game about boredom and self-pity. It's about myself, mostly. You walk around and press the interact button. Sorry for making this. It shows a shame or embarrassment with their work, perhaps a sense of vulnerability. The trailer for the game itself is a mockery of its creator and the creation they've made. It's, in a sense, an anti-trailer on a platform where every game is trying to get your attention as fast as possible, the author is more than happy to just spend time showing footage devoid of anything interesting, 
right until its last few seconds where it pulls the rug from under you and ends the trailer. The fact that the whole trailer is built to look like a crappy Windows Movie Maker project is the creator downplaying themselves and their emotions, because it is easier to do that than to open yourself up emotionally, and I can understand that. In providing marketing that successfully presents what kind of experience a person may expect, it further humiliates and downplays the creator's feelings and emotions, and doesn't it just feel wrong? Perhaps it's a form of catharsis, a way to exert those strong emotions. I honestly don't know. I think this discussion of the creator's vulnerability is best left for a later part of the video essay. And now that we have established an introduction for life tastes like cardboard, let's drive our attention to the art style of the game, because both visually and thematically, it's a very appropriate way to depict abstract emotionality. So how does one properly portray emotions? The answer is expressionism. Expressionism is a movement in the art world that is said to have originated from Germany, with artists such as Edvard Munch, Van Gogh, and James Ensor. Expressionism is the idea of presenting a distorted view of reality in order to portray an artist's inner feelings or thoughts. Features such as a vivid colour palette and expressive brushwork are used to create a highly textured piece of artwork. Life Tastes Like Cardboard is very expressive, having the previously mentioned features that define expressionist art. Its use of said art is varied, not only in terms of its colour palette, but with how it chooses to express itself in multiple ways. Glitching. Pencil lines. Pixelation. They all add texture. Even the way the game uses framing gives each scene a painteresque touch that emphasizes that inspiration with expressionism. The use of framing also adds to the theme of depression. This idea of the game's playable space being confined to a portion of the screen reinforces the metaphor that depression makes a person feel confined in their own suffering. Thus, it is not only a nod to how an artist's work is framed by its canvas, its use also has a purposeful metaphor behind it, which oddly feels cinematic. That analysis extends to how I also viewed various scenes throughout the game. The aesthetic of life tastes like cardboard is very hallucinogenic, and watching John disassociate from reality and further delve into this dreamlike state that reflects their emotions was utterly engrossing. Whether or not it was intentional, how a scene is portrayed can reflect some of the themes that Life Tastes Like Cardboard explores. Let's examine one scene as an example. Observe this scene. What can you make of it? It's a very large hall with a lot of pillars, yes. But what can it represent? To me, it represents insignificance. The size of this hall can be felt by how your footsteps echo. The use of muted purple can suggest wealth. Purple is often associated with royalty, and you need wealth to be royal, after all. This scene, to me, is an abstract representation of the power of wealth. The muted purple suggests that the protagonist has no desire for wealth, but understands the significance of it, and the dominance of it shows how insignificant they are because they are of a lower wealth class. Am I reading too much into this? Probably, but it is implied that the protagonist does struggle with money, a common problem that any student will deal in their time at university. I am just piecing bits together based on what the game has given me. I shared this image with a friend of mine and asked what they thought it represented. Their response was this. Columns are symbolic of firm ideals, 
they're unnaturally high and trail off in the distance. It could be a representation of the feeling of not living up to the ideals that were set out for you, and they only grow as time passes. Art is prominent in life tastes like cardboard. Even outside of the analysis of its art style and how it uses symbolism to explore real-world issues, the game is upfront about the importance of art in its story, both in terms of visual cues and dialogue. It has discussion around art, whether it would be, again, the metaphors of orange juice in a can, or how art critics can be elitist in what is or isn't high art, or how one of the characters' favorite classes in high school was art, or the presence of not one but two art museums. It can be seen that art plays a big role in this narrative. Perhaps even the creator of this game has a rooted passion for art. It is shown through the game that the creator understands the value of art. Art is often seen as an output for depression and a way to cope with depressive thoughts. And it's understood that through art, one can heal. Take the existence of art therapy, for example. I also think the existence of life tastes like cardboard comes from a place where the creator, Demensa, was in a dark place, and thus used this project as an outlet for all the bottled up feelings and thoughts that contributed to their depression, as well as a place for them to express themselves through art. In regards of developer intention, do they see their game as art? Who knows, I can't speak for them. But I believe that life tastes like cardboard is art. I think there is a lot to dissect in this game, and that doesn't extend to just its themes, or its use of art, but also with its music, and how it reflects the pacing of the game beautifully. It's a soundtrack for emotions. Good soundtrack serves to fit the tone of a game and respond to its pace. A great soundtrack works in harmony with its game and elevates it, to where a game and its music are inseparable. Life Tastes Like Cardboard definitely has a great soundtrack, but why? And more importantly, how? How does a soundtrack adequately reflect its game without falling into tired tropes? In the case of Life Tastes Like Cardboard, it's the personal touch provided by Demensa himself. The music of the soundtrack is varied, and it's kind of hard to figure out which genre serves as the music's starting point. In a way, its use of soundtrack is quite clever, and a good example of where that is most evident is in its start. The game opens up with this slow, collected guitar piece, that evokes early alternative rock, not too dissimilar to an OK Computer era Radiohead, or a Surfer Rosa Pixies. But as that opening sequence of repeating John's daily routine continues, it deteriorates from reality into the abstract. And that's when the game transitions that guitar-centric piece into one with distorted and off-key electronic music. In doing this, it tells the player a condensed summary of the experience of the whole game, as well as deviating the music from what a player may have expected. I don't think the opening of the game would have been as impactful if it weren't for the music that elevated it. The use of different music genres to reflect different emotions is also quite clever. The bulk of Life Tastes Like Cardboard's music is a mixture of ambient, dark ambient, electronic, and chiptune. But how each is used is completely different. It's often associated with scenes that are happy. Calming. Or omniscient of what's to come.
harsher moments in the game are orchestrated with noise and distorted guitars that overwhelm your ears. But thanks to its sparing use of noise, it makes those moments all the more impactful when it's present. And then the presence of guitar-centric music represents the organic and behaves as a bridge between the two extremes. When tracks with guitar are presented, it's often an evocation of distant melancholy, but it can also reflect familiarity and comfort. It reinforces humanity. What I found oddly pleasant was how a fair amount of the music is nostalgic. It's fitting, given how the game itself explores the topic of nostalgia and a longing for childhood innocence. One of my favorite tracks in the game is an example of that nostalgia and a wonderful example of how the visual experience and the auditory experience really just create such a beautiful moment. At this point in the game, you are exploring a series of mazes, and the visuals reflect an 8-bit game. Thus, the use of chiptune music reflects that. The way the song sways between its highs and lows, as well as the puzzling mazes, reflects this idea of John being lost in life, and desiring for a time where things were simpler, thus desiring for childhood innocence. There is a delicate handling of the music composition that ultimately results in music that's inseparable from its game. And it's that inseparability that's made some of my strongest memories with this game. When I listen to the soundtrack outside of the game, I can only visualize some of the scenes of that game. And if it weren't for the music, the game wouldn't nearly be as impactful. And for a game that explores such a painful topic, especially in the perspective the player interacts with the game, it needs a strong auditory experience to pack a weighty punch. A weighty punch that really hammers in the narrative of life tastes like cardboard, and its story full of pain. Discussing the narrative for a game like this is really tough. There is a lot of emotional pain in the story of Life Tastes Like Cardboard, and it's all interlaced with various other themes that make up the whole package. But what makes it tough isn't the abstract manner of the narrative, but how much it hurts. What can't be denied about the story is how personal it is, and alongside depression, the game explores other subjects, such as introspection, nostalgia, and loss. There is a strong evocation of longing and melancholy in this game, as well as moments where the characters ponder over seemingly meaningless topics. And if anything, there is a stronger focus on those topics. Stuff like the aforementioned packaging of orange juice in a can. Favorite flavors, what can be constituted as a flavor, music, and much more. These topics have a few purposes, Segments like these aim to lighten the weight of an overarching theme. Conversations between John and Ollie also contribute to character development. But that character development isn't in what is being said, but its importance in the context of John's story. If we were to reflect on the opening of the game once more, we can see that John's routine lacks social interaction, and yes, the idea of that opening isn't to show that, but it's an observation I noticed. 
and that theory is only emphasized with how awkward John tends to be when talking to Ollie. John's depression has isolated them from others, and depression can do that to a person. While we are on topic, I want to ponder on Ollie as a character and their purpose in the game's story. What is the importance of Ollie, and what do they represent in this narrative of John's depression? Ollie perhaps could be a representation of a better version of John. They both behave on the same wavelength, and share a fair amount in common. Ollie even excelled in their hobby of art, as seen by the painting in their house, whereas John's attempts at being creative trailed off, like their attempt at music for example. Ollie could also be the light at the very end of the tunnel for John, that one person you need to keep you going, to encourage you to push on just a little more, telling you that everything is okay. Maybe Ollie is a representation of John's exploration of self-identity. Ollie exudes this self-confidence in them with the way they speak, and how they express themselves. Perhaps if John weren't suffering from mental issues, this could have been them, or at the very least, they could have had this confidence in themselves. With regards to nostalgia, it has a significant place in the story with this particular focus on John's childhood. There are parts of the story that revolve around the character's past. Throughout the various chapters of the game, you have a chance to pick up secret items. These are an assortment of objects that have significance to the character's past, often their childhood. There's also a classroom section in the story, which is presented in this upbeat attitude via this rhythm minigame where you sip on a can of orange juice to the music. This is in stark contrast to other segments of the game where emotions can range from reserved sadness to harsh misery. While that happiness is fleeting, it's still there. As previously mentioned, the maze section has visuals that reflect an old-school 8-bit game and in tangent with its infectiously wonderful song, it evokes the spirit of that era of games. Perhaps in a way it's dementia's capturing off that wonder a child may have when first discovering video games. I can't exactly relate, but I can imagine as a child growing up with a Game Boy for example, you may have experienced a wow factor playing games on that system. The way all these segments are presented reflects a desire for childhood innocence, a desire to return to a time where life seemed much more enjoyable, and where things didn't seem so harsh, because as children we're somewhat ignorant of the reality of things around us, and John wants that, but it is lost with age and only continues to do so. Childhood innocence isn't the only thing that John mourns the loss of, there is loss in the literal sense. Towards the end of the game, it is mentioned that John's mother and sister passed away. There is also the loss in the sense of a passion or desire, such as the loss of creativity, which was previously mentioned when talking about Ollie's importance. Arguably the strongest exploration of loss is the deteriorating of one's perception of reality, Reality seemingly doesn't exist in the context of the game, and while hints of reality are present here and there, they are often distorted enough to where they mesh into the surreal dreaminess of the game, in a way presenting figments of John's memories in all the abstract imagery. The topic of loss in the narrative is the one area of the game's narrative that is less based on what is presented, but more on loose speculation. A lot of what I initially wrote was focused on the loss of Jean's creativity. However, as I spent more time with my thoughts on the game, I doubted myself a little more. I mentioned that art was an integral part of this game, and I believe the loss of creativity also plays into that. Exploring art museums, multiple discussions of art and metaphor, a computer full of old music ideas, or even the idea of making a game that didn't result in anything fruitful. All of these point to a loss of creative expression, and that seems to bother John, maybe even Dementia themselves. 
Depression is the response to loss, but it's also the catalyst for one to lose, and John seems to have lost a lot. Whether it's the loss of creativity, or a loved one, or a perception of reality, it has all contributed into the downward spiral of John's mental state, and it's resulted in these harsh sprouts of raw depression that are present throughout the game's visuals in such an upfront manner. It paints into perspective the amount of pain on display, and it just feels like so much for one person to go through. I think it's time we tackled that topic that I've somewhat kind of avoided talking about directly. We need to talk about depression. A lot of people tend to be affected by depression, or rather be affected by mental health as a whole. To paint an idea of the scale of its impact, here are some statistics from MHFA England, which states that one in four people experience mental health issues every year, with 792 million affected by it worldwide. In this particular case, making note of the statistics of mental health in higher education tells us that 34% of students report having psychological difficulties for which they need professional help. These statistics aren't meant to be gospel, but they should hopefully paint an idea of how alarmingly common mental health issues are, even without the consideration that there's perhaps more people that don't report themselves. So how does this tie to the game? One could make the inquiry that the inception of life tastes like cardboard was perhaps the result of undergoing depression through college slash university. And I'm not just going on that solely based on the opening of the game featuring college lectures. The writing in the game has a sort of late teens, early twenties introspection tinged with sadness and the idea of being in this crossroad where you still don't know what to do with yourself, but are close to entering adult life. You're at a crossroad between adolescent ignorance and the forced maturation brought by the acceptance of adulthood, and it just sucks to be in that place. To feel like you don't know what to do with yourself, to feel lost, and to feel like you're making choices that you later realise you regret. And all of that can lead into a downward spiral of one's mental health. This is all speculation based on my personal experience, so of course don't take this as definitive proof of Demenza's intentions or personal life. One could safely assess that Demenza's experiences are perhaps what a lot of John's experiences are based on. After all, they do mention on their Steam page that the game is about themselves. I still stand by my theory that this was a project for Demensa to output all of their emotions, and what we are left with is an intense experience with a lot of facets and depth, as well as a small glimpse into this one person's depression, but that is ultimately just one part of this person. I'm not making the claim that I completely know this person based off of the fact that they have an experience that I relate to personally. But there is this sense of understanding that person's pain without having them outright tell me about it through narrative. And through this game, we can all find a way to heal ourselves. If only for a short moment. What this results in is a game that's perhaps one of the most visceral explorations of depression. And one that perhaps not everyone will jive with. And one that I certainly can't talk about adequately. How everyone experiences depression is different, and while one may relate to this game, another may take offence to it. I think what's most damning is how it could perhaps encourage an environment of self-hate, and there's plenty of that in life tastes like cardboard. whether it's through the story or how Demensa presents the game via its marketing. The game pulls no punches and is incredibly unnerving with its imagery when it needs to be. And it's, 
it's hard to discuss that aspect of the game. On the one hand, it perfectly encapsulates how damning depression is. How overwhelming it can be to the point where it causes you to consider thoughts of ending yourself. But I can't exactly delve too much into this, and I don't know if I can discuss these thoughts without feeling like I'm doing this subject a disservice. I want more media to cover mental health, but here I am bumbling about and unable to provide a coherent sentence about it myself. I can't face my own sprouts of depression because I prefer the numbing acceptance that I am in this rut by my own doing, and that I have failed as a person. In a way, I feel like writing this video essay is me confronting myself and my own emotions. And in a way, I like to think that this game was that for Dementsa, a confrontation of their depression. It's ironic I titled this segment of the essay, We Need to Talk About Depression, because I can't seem to adequately discuss it, at least not in an upfront manner. But I think this just goes to show how complex depression can be. I can talk about how Dementsa explores various facets of depression through visuals, or music, or dialogue but I struggle to confront the topic. Perhaps I don't feel adequate in talking about depression. I haven't really overcome my own depression. But I can talk about how this game affected me and what it meant to me. I've been diagnosed with depression before. I've had major episodes of depression. At the time of writing, I've been experiencing a few spurs of depression, perhaps due to lockdown. At the time I replayed this game, I was in a terrible place struggling with my own thoughts of my identity, my self-worth, my worth as an academic student, my worth as a person. I felt helpless and frustrated at the unfairness of life. And when I looked at others, all I could see was jealousy. And then I would hate myself for that jealousy. I was, and I guess I still am, a university dropout. I went into uni thinking it would be a turn for my life given that I had struggled in school, but that didn't turn out to be the case. Revisiting life tastes like cardboard made me feel content, hopeful even. I embarked on its journey and felt all its emotions, and its ending completely broke me, but I completely appreciated it. After spending a month with nothing but bottled up frustration and self-hatred, it felt refreshing to just cry. It felt like a heavy burden was lifted off my shoulder. There's value in media like that. It's a place where people can exert those feelings, introspect on them, and maybe even come out feeling better. We could all use an ollie in our lives. Whatever the reason may be for this game's existence, I'm glad it exists, and I think there is a place for media that explores depression as its main topic. There is of course a wrong way to do it, let's not forget the 13 reasons why it existed, and I definitely wouldn't trust a AAA publisher with this subject, but in the indie space I think there is a place for a developer to explore mental health, no matter what it may be. Art is a powerful tool for expressing a person's thoughts, ideas, and feelings, and it has the ability to enrich in a person, perhaps even heal them. I believe that games can be art, and should be art, and life tastes like hardboard is art. Thank you for watching. Likes, comments, and subscriptions are appreciated. To the creator of this game, Dementor, I hope you're in a better place. Take care.